The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. What a wonderful and challenging feast we celebrate here at Pentecost. This feast challenges us because it puts to lie a lazy, sleeping, hidden, and tepid Christian life. The Lord Jesus said to the apostles and still says to us, I have come to cast a fire on the earth. This is a feast about fire, a transformative, refining, purifying fire that the Lord wants to kindle in us and in this world. It's about a necessary fire. For as the Lord first judged the world by fire, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, because it is going to be the fire next time. We need tongues of Pentecost fire to fall on us, to set us on fire, to bring us up to the temperature of glory. That the readings today speak to us of the Holy Spirit in three ways. First, it gives us portraits of the Spirit. Then, proclamation of the Spirit. And finally, propagation of the faith by the Spirit. That the readings today give us two different images, two different portraits of who the Spirit is. Rushing wind and tongues of fire. That these two images recall Psalm 50, which says, Our God comes... He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Round about him a mighty tempest. Notice how the Acts of the Apostles opens up. That when the time of Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from a sky a noise like a strong driving wind. And it filled the entire house which they were. That this text brings to us the very root of the meaning of the word spirit. That spirit refers to breath. That this word, in this word, is preserved the word respiration. The very act of breathing. That there is that idea of spiration going on here. That the spirit of God is the breath of God. That's why in the second verse in the book of Genesis, the second verse of the entire Bible, goes and says, the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And then, in the second chapter of Genesis, speaks even more remarkably of something God did only for man, not for the animals. That the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So the very Spirit of God was breathed into Adam. But as we know, Adam lost that grace. Lost that grace of God. Died spiritually when he committed that first sin. Original sin. And thus we see in this passage from the Acts of the Apostles an amazing and wonderful resuscitation of the human person. That as these first Christians, the apostles, experienced the rushing wind of God's Spirit, breathing spiritual life back into them, that God is doing CPR on humanity, bringing humanity, dead from sin, back to life. 
the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us once again as in a temple. That we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That it's been said that Christmas is the feast of God with us. Good Friday is the feast of God for us. But Pentecost is the feast of God in us. That the text from Acts then goes on, saying that then there appeared to them tongues as a fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. The Bible often speaks of God as fire in fiery terms. That when we see Moses sees God as that burning bush. Or that God led the people, the Israelites, out of Egypt through the desert as a pillar of fire. That Moses went up onto a fiery Mount Sinai where God was. That Psalm 97 goes and says, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Thick clouds and thick darkness are round about him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him, burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. That the scriptures also call God a holy fire, a consuming fire, a refining fire. And so it is that our God, who is a holy fire, comes to dwell in us through his Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Fire, he refines us by burning away our sins, purifying us. That as Job once said, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I come forth as gold. That God is also preparing us for judgment. For if he is a holy fire, then who may endure the day of his coming or of going to him? What can endure the presence of fire himself? That which already has been tried by fire. Fire tried gold. Gold that we have been tried, purified, made ready to be with him. That thus we must be set afire by God's love. And so in the coming of the Holy Spirit, God sets us on fire to make us a kind of fire. And in doing so, he purifies us, prepares us to meet him one day, to meet him who is a holy fire. That you'll notice that the Spirit came on them like tongues of fire. And the reference to tongues is no accident. For notice how the Holy Spirit moves the apostles to speak and ultimately, finally, be those witnesses to Jesus Christ. That the text says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. So behold, how the Holy Spirit moves them to proclaim, not just within the safety of the upper room, but also in holy boldness before the crowds who have gathered. Notice who were in those crowds. That there are Parthians, Medes, Amalites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Asia, Egypt, people from Rome. These are people from across the known world at that time. People across the Roman Empire have come there for that feast in Jerusalem. And notice the transformation that has happened to the apostles. That moments ago, these were frightened men gathered in secrecy only behind locked doors. They were huddled together in fear. But now they go forth to the crowds, boldly proclaim Christ Jesus. They've gone from fear to faith, from cowardice to courage, from terror to testimony. So, what about us? The too many Christians in our day are silent, overcome by fear. Perhaps they fear being called names or being unpopular. Perhaps they're anxious about being laughed at or resisted or being asked questions they don't feel capable of answering. That some Christians nowadays are able to gather in the upper room of the parish. But once outside of the safe confines of that upper room, they slip into an undercover mode. They become secret agent Christians. Well, the Holy Spirit wants to change that, 
to the degree that we have really met Jesus Christ, experienced his Holy Spirit, that we are less able to keep silent, that we have to be able to go out and testify, that we can't keep it to ourselves what the Lord has done for us, of how we have experienced our God, our Savior, that the Holy Spirit, if authentically received, wants to give us zeal and joy, to burn away our fear, so that testifying and witnessing will come naturally to us. Notice also how the Spirit translates for the apostles, that the people in the crowd before them spoke different languages from across the world, yet each heard Peter and the other apostles speak in his own language. The Spirit therefore assists us, not only, but also those who hear us. That my testimony as a priest is not dependent only on my eloquence, but also on the grace of the Holy Spirit, who casts out deafness and opens hearts. That every Christian should remember this. That some of our most doubtful encounters with others can still bear great fruit on account of the work of the Holy Spirit who translates for us, overcomes many obstacles we might think are insurmountable. That in this past year as a priest, I can think of times in my priestly ministry where I have encountered somebody coming to me about something in their lives. And something pops into my head that I learned those years ago in seminary that I say in that moment, that I normally probably wouldn't have said. Something that just comes there. It's that movement of the Holy Spirit. That we have to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Be docile to those movements. Open ourselves to using those seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that we received at confirmation. That we have to fulfill that great commission Jesus gave us a week ago to go out preaching to all nations of the good news, baptizing them all of how is the Lord going to fulfill that commission, that it's not by just via some magic fairy dust. It's the fiery transformation of every Christian going forth to bring warmth and light to a cold, dark world. That this is a commission that has been set before us, that we receive from our baptism. That the four men yesterday ordained priests for our diocese have taken on as their burden to be able to go forth to proclaim the gospel, to bring souls to God. That when they die and before they go to God, they have to answer to God of were they those true witnesses of the gospel. That is something I have to answer to. Something that I've been having to work on in this past year as a priest. Laying myself out as that witness to the gospel that this is how the Lord casts fire on the earth. This is how the Spirit of the Lord fills the orb of the earth by the lives of the saints, by our very lives, by us living out that life of holiness. That in the end, the Great Commission is our first and most important job, the propagation of the faith. Then no matter else, what else we do, we are supposed to do this. That we are called to do this. That parishes don't deserve to exist if they do not do this. That Christians do not do, are not worthy, are disgraceful of the name if they fail to win souls for Christ. That the Spirit of the Lord is going to fill the orb of the earth, but only through us. That the spread of the gospel has been placed in our hands. That this is what we are about. This is what the apostles were about. That we see them go forth on this day being those great witnesses to the faith. Those first 12 bishops. That they go forth and spread the gospel to the entire known world. Willing to lay down their lives for that gospel as 11 of the 12 do, that this is a challenging thing we are about, but it is a great thing about. It is getting out of the upper room, opening the doors of our lives of faith, proclaiming Christ to the world, 
letting the Holy Spirit light a fire in us so that we in turn can go light a fire in the world. That this is the work we have to accomplish in our lives. That this is the life of being a Christian. That this is the job we have of bringing light and warmth into a dark core world so that one day we can join our Heavenly Father Say, yes, we have accomplished your job. We have accomplished bringing souls closer to you. 